So the history of Psychopharm from my perspective is that, listen, I've been at this since 1985. Actually, this is the 20th anniversary of NEI, but I don't know if I'm proud or ashamed to say that next May will be my 50th anniversary from medical school. Oh my God. <laughs> and then uh, the following year will be my 50th anniversary from my PhD. So that's back in the late 70s. But I actually was um, recruited to go overseas at a brain research institute in my early 30s and left the uh, Stanford University to go to the UK and uh, go to a brain research institute to, it was funded by a major drug company at the time. And uh, at that time, the Royal Society of Medicine in the UK, which, which is where this was, outside of London, outside of Cambridge, it was 1985, and they said, would you review the future of psychopharmacology? Because we had this big new institute, and we're trying to think of where it's gonna go. Everybody was optimistic. Uh, some very famous neuroscientists, Les Iverson, and uh, you ever hear of Janssen Pharmaceuticals, the famous Paul Janssen, who uh, made many of those drugs, were there, and we had great expectancy, but ladies and gentlemen, by 2016, the American uh, society called Society for Neuroscience asked me to present a lecture entitled The Future Psychopharmacology is New Treatment Innovation Dead. So what happened? And in that time, all the big pharma pulled out of uh, psychopharm and psychiatry. They saw no future in it. Well, then turn right around and by, 19, by 2022, the APA, American Psychiatric Association, just last year asked me to present a lecture on the post-COVID future of psychopharm. So we've had ups and downs, and you could look at it like this. Here's a time course, and from 1950, uh, looking forward to the 2030 and beyond. So the first thing that came out was the old MAO inhibitors, the tricyclic antidepressants, TCAs, lithium stimulants, the first generation antipsychotics, and the benzodiazepines. And just for sake of reference, I don't know if you realize this, but the DSM-1 came out in 1952. This was the time in which we were trying to figure out what to call things, and although we really didn't know what they were, and they weren't diseases in the sense that you could see them under a microscope, we had to have a common nomenclature. This is uh, actually put into contrast for me. Uh, I, uh, I think Andy mentioned, been uh, doing some side things, looking at Jackson Pollock, for example, who was a famous artist, of course, with his paintings. And he had some form of mental illness. He was actually called schizophrenia back in the 19, late 30s and early 40s. Uh, but he probably really had bipolar. And back before DSM, uh, you could have your definition of schizophrenia and you could have yours and you could have yours and nobody really agreed. And what it tried to do is make a definition. Now, obviously, there's a lot of uh, controversies about the DSMs over the years. And they evolved during the uh, evolution of psychopharm. So the first generation was mostly serendipitous. The MAO inhibitors, I actually worked with E. Albert Zeller. Who is Zeller? Zeller was an enzymologist from Switzerland who actually emigrated to the United States, who then became a professor at Northwestern. And I uh, worked with him on monoamines and memory last century. And uh, Dr. Zeller was the guy who actually realized that these Swiss patients put up in the uh, resorts to recover from the tuberculosis in the mountains uh, in a sanitarium. Some of them were very depressed and others of them that got there and depressed got better. And they were on an anti-tuberculous drug and in his lab he discovered Ipronizid was the first one, was actually an MAO inhibitor. And um, the, 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 everything was serendipitous. Nobody knew what they were targeting. Uh, they didn't know why. They just knew that it worked. And so that was that generation. Well, then what came is that the uh, second generation, the DSM was uh, in 68. And then the th number three was in 1980. This was about the time I was actually um, training. So I got out of medical school in 75, my PhD is 76. I was following this. I always knew I wanted to go into either neurology or, or psychiatry. I took a, a neurology residency from 77 to 79, and from 79 to 81, I was at Stanford when the DSM-3 came out. And right at that point, the first age of darkness came. No more serendipity. Nobody could figure out new targets. Uh, they couldn't figure out how to actually figure out if drugs worked. And for at least 10 years, it was a funk. 
and nobody thought there would be any new, more drugs in psychiatry. Then all of a sudden, what I would call DSM-4 came out by, not really related to any of this, but the second generation of psychopharm occurred with the SSRIs, SNRIs, the so-called second generation antipsychotics. But if you look at it, they were just better targeters of the old targets. In other words, the SSRIs maybe didn't hit cholinergic receptors, but they still were working by the same way that tricyclics worked. Same thing with second generation antipsychotics. And uh, there was a lot of marketing and hype, and probably where they were better tolerated. And uh, they were more broadly used, uh, but they were not necessarily really efficacy improvements on the old stuff. And so guess what happened? Well, DSM-5, the last one we have, all of a sudden, the second age of darkness came out. And this is actually when the Society for Neuroscience thought that psychopharm might be dead and psychiatry might be dead, there'd be no new treatments. All the drug companies went into cancer and rare diseases and so forth. Um, but what happened is that the small companies started to look at targets. The big companies were all out, and that birthed the, what we're in now is the third generation of psychopharm. And finally, there are new targets. They're not like better ways to hit the serotonin reuptake pump. This is completely new stuff. And I'll talk really briefly about that, but this whole Congress will talk to you about all those new targets, and including some that are in, in the pipeline that, that aren't approved yet. So you've got the famous now NMDA antagonists. You'll hear about things called stenels, which work on NMDAs, the GABA neurosteroids, um, M1, M4 muscarinics, et cetera, psychedelics, uh, GLY-T1, glycine, reuptake inhibitors, and many others. So the future of psychopharmacology right now, we're in this third generation, we're looking at symptoms and circuits. In other words, we think that psychiatric disorders are due to inefficient information processing in specific circuits. So there's a sadness is in one circuit, insomnia is in a different circuit, motivation is in a different circuit, cognition is in a different circuit, and if they don't work right, you have a symptom. And so that means people can have the same symptom in different disorders. So in other words, if you have a problem concentrating in one disorder, and you also have it in another, probably both those patients have the same circuit out for the concentration part of it. And that leads us to a strategy, which is to target those circuits. And you do that by looking at connections. So you can call a circuit a network. You can call connections synapses. You can call them a node. If you're more of an engineer, you call it a node. The connections with networks. And, and actually, the, the, the marvelous uh, invention which actually in, it was in Time Magazine is one of the greatest inventions of the last century. Um, you just say came out this year was the muscarinic M1, M4 uh, agonist. And so why is that so good? It, because it works on the principle of finding a new node in an old psychosis network. And the more we understand networks, the more targets we're gonna have. But there's a little bit of serendipity involved. They still uh, have to keep your mind open that some of the things may occur by accident and you might be surprised. <laughs>